Hi everyone, how's it going? My name is David Cash, and welcome back to Fast Fashion, the show where we answer your fashion questions. Uh, so today I'm here again with our special guest, Astrid, Astrid Sedgwick. Hello. Uh, Astrid runs a Instagram account mm -hmm. uh, and is a fabulous model, stylist, makeup artist, extraordinaire, does a whole bunch of things in the Toronto industry. And yeah, Astrid was on our last episode. Uh, we were so happy about that, and she's back today again. Time has just magically passed, and oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> we just wore the same outfit. We just happen to be wearing the same thing two days in a row, completely unrelated, uh, yes. obviously. Uh, but yeah, thank you for coming back again. Of course. And uh, what's our topic today? <laughs> so our topic today is how people in the industry, whether it's makeup or styling or modeling, can learn how to monetize their skills and their business by asking for money. <laughs> which is actually a lot harder than it seems. Um, yeah, maybe for context, like um, Astrid, maybe tell a little bit about, like I'm obviously a photographer, a director, I do a whole bunch of things in that respect. Maybe tell them a little bit about what you've done and how you have, how you have this question, I guess. Like obviously you make money doing what you do, Yeah. but maybe some idea of like why it's difficult with clients or some kind mm -hmm. of like that. Well, um, I am a certified stylist and makeup artist uh, with the Toronto Fashion Academy, and I am a model who has a lot of experience uh, so I kind of know what I'm doing, I would just say, um, and I like have a skill set and I've developed it over time. Um, but I've noticed one thing that's a little difficult, especially in our city, is a lot of the people that you can easily find to collaborate with um, want you to do it TFP, which is time for print, uh, which is basically just a fancy way of saying free. Uh, and I did notice actually when I was first starting out, I loved doing these things because it helped me to build my portfolio, gain some experience, but then after a certain amount of time, it felt like I was just kind of doing things for free that I could be doing to get paid for. <laughs> like I had a makeup kit that I had invested money in. Yeah. Like my time became valuable as I learned what I was doing. Like as I did more modeling, I kind of learned how to be more professional on set, how to get poses, how to do facial expressions that weren't weird. Like I like I just knew that my quality of work had improved. And I just find it I'm sure a lot of other people also find it very hard sometimes to kind of give someone like a price or a budget yeah. because I don't want them to be like offended or sure. to be like, how dare you? So this is this is a tricky <laughs> one always because yeah. especially in the creative industry, especially when you live in a big city like we do in Toronto, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the people you work with are your friends uh, mm -hmm. and that or people you like or enjoy their company with. You don't want to make them upset essentially, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think this is the biggest concept of TFP. I actually made, I'm sure you know, I made some hats not too long ago that said no TFP. I have one. Uh, she has one uh, for a bunch of models in the city. I was selling those. And I'll um, wear it for the next episode. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> um, but essentially I'm not, I'm not promoting people to not do TFP shoots. I'm mm -hmm. not. Because uh, I still do them every once in a while today. I think it's really just being conscious as you progress in your own work. Uh, in your own place within the industry, mm -hmm. um, being more conscious of what value you're getting back for the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So by that, I mean, I think you should always get paid, quote unquote, for everything that you do, but that can mean a whole lot of things. Mm -hmm. I think that the trade aspect is almost as important as the as the payment. Mm -hmm. So like when you're starting, like you said, when you're starting in the industry, we're by no means saying, if you've, if you've only done two or three photo shoots, do free shoots, yes. learn, get better, improve yourself, you know, work on yourself, do those things. But I think once you have a portfolio, um, whether you're a makeup artist, model, you know, photographer, whatever the case may be, once you have a portfolio, you have to start taking yourself a little bit more seriously. And in those cases, I think to start, I mean, you've obviously done this step. I'm just kind of like stepping yeah. back a little bit. I think you have to start asking for some money mm -hmm. just to kind of differentiate yourself from an amateur into a professional. Yes. Because at some point, even if you do work a second job, if you want this to be your career, you have to make that jump from yes. this is something that I'm doing to expand my own portfolio to this is something that I'm doing as a career. And then you also get to At any level, part time, whatever. Yeah. As well, where like you are taking a lot of time out of your life to yeah. do this. Like you're not doing a shift, you're doing a shoot. Yeah, and I think in those kinds of cases, I think like I always, I classify things very much as um, like amateur, beginner, professional, like fancy, fancy. I guess there's like all Super those kinds pro. of like steps uh, as you kind of progress in the industry, everything from when you're booking jobs and you have a part-time job, like booking jobs and paid jobs, mm -hmm. and then when you're working full-time, like I am now, like I'm very fortunate to be saying that, but I'm working full-time doing creative work as my living, you know? Um, but those are, those are big steps between each of those, and I think the biggest shift that you need to make between, you know, pay, getting paid a little bit to getting paid enough to support yourself 
is how you present your work to begin with. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is like we were kind of talking about in the last episode, having a professional portfolio, a website, uh, mm -hmm. maybe that's not the aspect of it that we talked about, but if you can present your work in a way that makes it look expensive, mm -hmm. then people will be less afraid to pay you money. I'm not saying that that's the be all end all, this is how you get paid. Mm -hmm. But I'd say that's a, that was a big shift for me. Like now when I send people my reel and my website, mm -hmm. the first thing I get is we're so happy we got you because they think I'm booked as fuck, you know? Yes. You want you want your reel, you want your website to make mm -hmm. you seem booked and busy, you know? Yes. And you know, there is an aspect to fake it till you make it, but to the same degree, I think you're already at a point, a lot of people are at a point where you've been doing this for a few years now, three years, five years, and I think at that point is really when you start to have enough content that you can present it in a way that does look very professional. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that's the point maybe where you're at right now, um, that it's worth investing a little bit into a website, into, you know, like I said, like a Squarespace or something like that, where you can present yourself in the best way possible. Because mm -hmm. even if you do have a social media presence and an Instagram, um, that'll attract all kinds of attention, which I'm sure you're aware of. Everything from paid shoots to TFP, mm -hmm. constantly, consistently, all the time. People are gonna be messaging you because they see you online. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you have a website and if what you send back in those kinds of situations is like, maybe not even here are my rates, but what's your budget? That's a big question. You know, I, I recommend people a lot of time to ask that as one of the first questions, because then at least it establishes that this is a paid gig. And even yes. if you're getting paid a little bit less than what you're used to or what you would expect, or, you know, I, I've done some work for banks and stuff. And, you know, I expect like 300 an hour or something like that because it's a fucking bank. But, you know, sometimes they have budgets and they have specific amounts of money that they can spend on a project. Mm -hmm. So if you start the conversation with mentioning that you're aware of that, that, you know, that sets your footing in a really good place where worst case scenario, they're still gonna pay you, mm -hmm. even if it's a little bit less than you might want for the gig that it might be. Yes. Um, and I think you have to be flexible. I think you have to be aware of your value, mm -hmm. especially, especially like what you mentioned with your kit. Um, this took a, bit, a long time for me to learn and it actually took my, my boyfriend uh, is in a photography degree program and it took me, you know, listening to a couple of things that they said where they charge for everything. A lot of these uh, like professors who are professional photographers, you know, mm -hmm. they charge for everything. They charge for getting there, which I still do. You know, I'll charge for my Uber if I have to Uber there. Um, they'll charge for, you know, uh, lens rentals. They'll charge for space rentals. They'll charge for use of their backdrops. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll charge for everything. So to the same effect, if you're a makeup artist and you're bringing your kit and they're not paying you enough, um, yes. The big trick that a lot of people in LA use, you know, I lived in LA for a little while, now I'm in Toronto. Um, instead of sometimes getting paid, they'll ask you to rent their kit because the kit rental kit will be, fee. yeah, it'll be higher than what you'd be getting paid. Because sometimes to rent your kit, what would you charge? Like, I don't know, 200 bucks? And they may want to pay you $80. Mm -hmm. So instead you say, okay, I'm not going to charge you, but you have to do my kit rental because I can't come otherwise. Mm -hmm. Because I, you're paying for this makeup that I've already paid for. Mm -hmm. So honestly, a lot of people in LA will do a kit rental instead of charging because mm -hmm. it's already your equipment, it's already your stuff. But wouldn't you rather make two hundred dollars than eighty dollars? They're not going to pay you two eighty. Let's say the situation is they're not going to pay you two eighty. They already said they only have an eighty dollars budget for the makeup artist. But you said I can bring all the makeup for your whole range of models, but I need you to rent my kit for one eighty or two hundred. Yes. They're much more likely to pay that when you explain what you're bringing instead of just like I'm going to show up because that's so smart. You know what I mean? Because there's there's value with you. Like yes. not every makeup artist has a kit, especially beginner ones who want to do it for free. You know, if you're a student at CMU and this is your first time ever doing makeup it's not necessarily, you're not gonna have all this stuff. Yeah. But you've been doing this for a little while, you're certified, you have this and that, you have all these credentials. Mm -hmm. A big thing that sets you apart is the fact that you have a full kit, the yes. full kit, right? And, and sell that, you know? Sell that as part of your value. It's same with a stylist. You know, you can mention that you have relationships with Toronto brands, you can do polls for free. Mm -hmm. That's also a big thing. And, and uh, a lot of the time, instead of charging um, a pull fee, uh, as in charging the designer's pull fee, <clears throat> sometimes a lot of stylists that I know will get that for themselves. You know, they'll charge hourly to run out pulling or they'll be just a generic like I come with clothes for this price yeah um, or like a personal shopping like yeah, experience yeah, totally but um, I think a big part of that is um, I still do charge hourly a lot of the time mm -hmm. but I think a big shift is changing from hourly price base to project price base mm -hmm. so if somebody says I want you to do a photo shoot with me but you know that that means you have to do two pulls two returns a photo shoot a fitting a this a this a this bringing stuff all around just when you send your invoice, mm -hmm. just break that down. And even if you're charging less than your usual rate for each of those things, at least make sure the client is aware that you're doing all these things for them. Yes. Because they might not even think about it. I'm thinking about a few, I don't want to name names, but I'm thinking of a few people we've worked with in the past um, who honestly, they just, they don't know that this much work goes into it or they're not aware that it's considered work. Because, you know, especially if they're a musical artist 
or if they're a fashion designer, this is their passion, this is what they do for a living. Even if it is their brand and they're paying you, yeah. it's still something that they're doing out of passion. So I feel like a lot of time it's, without being rude, you can just lay out the steps involved mm -hmm. and that can help, you know, add value to your pricing. And that also makes you look very professional. Yeah, it's like it's, you're aware of what's involved ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, there's something to be said about that because you know, especially think about like the first couple of years of your, of your, even even recently, I'm sure there's been gigs where you show up and there's something unexpected. But I think that the more you do gigs, especially the more you do the same types of gigs, mm -hmm. um, that starts happening less and less. And you start to be like, oh, this is happening, I'll do this. Oh, this is happening, I'll do that. And that's what people have to start paying for because mm -hmm. they pay for your experience. You know, they pay for your, something's gonna go wrong. And you know, when I'm directing or when I'm producing, um, I'm not worried about that at all. You know, even the day before, if a model drops, it's gonna be stressful, but I know what I'm doing. I've done, I've dealt with that hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. And same thing, you know, if somebody didn't bring their eyelashes, you can probably make something happen. If somebody yes. didn't bring their foundation, you can make something happen, but that's mm -hmm. what they're paying for. You know, you have to, it's value-based pricing. It's really um, pricing for a gig based on what you're bringing to the table, specifically yes. for that job. And that's why when somebody says, what are your rates? I have a very difficult time answering that question. That's I'll usually just say, question. I'll usually just say $1,000 a day because I am, I am $1,000 a day. Am I necessarily going to charge you for the specific thing that you want $1,000 a day? No. But if you're going to be vague with me, I'm going to be vague with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That makes sense. And to the same effect, if somebody says, if somebody asks me a generic question, like what do you charge for a music video? I'll say, uh, give or take $10,000 mm -hmm. because I don't know what they want. If they want me to hire myself, a crew, makeup artists, hair, models, models dancers, choreographers, you know, yeah. all of that, around 10 grand. The whole but you know what? Show. We can also make that same music video for $2,000, but yeah. only if they tell me what they want, what budget they have, like that conversation needs to be had. Same with you, you know, mm -hmm. especially like, and, and a big thing that I'll often do recently, um, you know, I'm lucky enough to have my own studio. I have a lot of people like you, a lot of like my boyfriend, a lot of other people that I work with on a regular basis. Um, adding to the package. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I'll give you a call being like, hey, I'm doing this and I also need a this. Mm -hmm. um, can you do it? And if you do that for them, maybe they'll throw in a little bit of extra money, you know, finding those different ways that you can help more. Mm -hmm. Because I think anything creative uh, in the creative industry, you're solving a problem. Like creative work is creative problem solving. It's solving problems that other people do not have the technical skills to solve. Like if somebody needs a winged eye, that means they do not have the problem solving skills to make a winged eye. You do, you've learned how to do that. Mm -hmm. So sell that and know what that's worth, you know? Because mm -hmm. a lot of the time, uh, you know, so they'll, they'll be like, oh, well, we'll get somebody else. Say, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Because would you want to go and do a gig for free? No. Of course not. So wouldn't it be better if they found somebody who does? But even if like <laughs> the worst case does happen, there are ways to ensure that your time is not fully wasted. Like, yeah. I know you have experience and I do not with this, but I'm kind of, trying to start doing this yeah. with a deposit being put down. Totally, totally. And I think that's yeah. really important. I mean, these days, I will not step foot on a set unless it's like a very reputable production company. Like I'm talking like a TV channel on television mm -hmm. that I can like see on TV right now. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like if I can't turn to a channel and see your TV channel, I'm not doing this with you. But anybody else, at least a 50% deposit up front mm -hmm. and, and a contract these days. I used to do a lot of like, and I'm sure you're used to the small gigs when it's under $200 and you don't sign a contract, you say, yeah, I'll help you out, I'll do it. Honestly, those are always the gigs that will come back to bite you in the ass. Yeah. Always, always. Not 100% of the time, but like 90% yeah. of the time. And you know what, it's always the stupid gig. It tends to be the, the $3,000 gig that you booked, this whole fancy thing. You know, they might pay you 30 days late, but they're gonna pay you mm -hmm. because they have a financial services company working for them or something. But you know, if Betsy Lou wants you to do some styling work for her photo shoot with her brother, mm -hmm. and you don't have a contract or you didn't get a deposit, mm -hmm the odds that you'll see that money without a fight are very low, yeah. you know? And like, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a pacifist, you know? I don't like to fight, you know? Some people do, some people don't. I'm good, I'm fine, I don't wanna fight. So if I'm gonna do any work for somebody these days, I have a very basic contract I recently wrote up just, mm -hmm. just so I can be like, oh, you wanna come over for a two hour photo shoot? Here's the contract. And this contract, yeah. how do you make it like an actual binding thing? Google. Yeah. Do you know how many contracts are on the internet? That's fair, yeah. but like, what happens if they break it? Nothing. Oh, what do you mean? Are you gonna sue them? Probably not. What do you mean probably not? Do you know how much a lawyer costs? I know, I don't. Expensive. <laughs> lawyers are expensive. Lawyers, lawyers are expensive. Yeah. If you don't want it, like, think about this. A contract is basically just a piece of paper that states your terms, mm -hmm. right? It, it just shows from the beginning of your gig, mm -hmm. these are the terms we both agreed on. So the when 30 days later, Bessie Lou comes back and says, hey, you were supposed to do this, this, and this, and I only got this, 
-hmm. You can say, no, actually, here's the contract that you signed on this day where I said I would do this, this, and this. Yes. And that's it. Mm -hmm. That's what a contract's for. It makes it, like, easier to communicate kind of it, what the expectation it, is. It's, it makes it clear. It yes. makes the expect It makes the expectations clear, and it allows you to have a document that's dated mm -hmm. to go back on when inevitably there's some issue. Yes. If there is some issue, not every time, obviously, but if there is some issue, you have something to go back on. And then also, like you said, like, what are you going to do legally in terms of a contract? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously try to make it as legally binding as possible. Look at some stuff online, do a little bit of research. Honestly, everything is on the internet these days in terms of that. There's even some sites that will make contracts for you mm -hmm. and you can pay for or just copy. Mm -hmm. um, I've done that sometimes. <laughs> no tea, no shit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's just having assurance. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. So you have your assurance that all of these steps are the steps that are being agreed on before. But yes. then also, if you're gonna sue them or you want to sue them or if they did something bad against you, yeah. remember that the lawyer costs like at least a thousand dollars. Yeah. At least, just for a consultation. So it's just for them to look at the contract. <laughs> yeah. So unless it's a ten thousand dollar contract, don't hire a lawyer. Yeah. Just tell them to fuck off and smear their name. Because yeah. smearing somebody's name is almost as bad as suing them. Yes. In some cases worse. There are, Especially in a very tight knit industry. Yeah, there's like know? a lot of groups as well that yeah. are kind of like the blacklist. Totally. Like if someone is unprofessional to a degree, you can communicate that to people. And so I'm not promoting. Like, I'm not saying go out and blacklist everybody you know. Yeah, no, no. But no. <laughs> I mean, if you if you were gonna sue them, yeah, I'd say it's a better response instead of suing them to just post something on the internet yeah. and make sure other people don't work with. Them. Yes, but that's like worst case. Probably. That's worst case. That's yeah. totally worst case scenario. Ideally, if you get a 50% deposit or a lot of the time in my case, re honestly, recently, if it's under $500, something that I've done a lot of the time is say um, either 100% deposit upon showing up. So we won't start shooting until I get paid mm -hmm. or 50% upon showing up 50% before you leave. Yes. So like you'll still get paid in entirety that day, mm -hmm. but you know, You'll, the, the, the client can be a little bit more, you know, comfortable maybe. If, they, if, it's a, if, you're, if it's your first time working with them or something, they might be more comfortable giving you half and half. That mm -hmm. might be the case. But um, honestly, I found that unless, again, unless it's a huge corporate client, because this is a very specific situation and they have, you know, they have, they have financial obligations, essentially. You know, they, they can't pay you in this certain way because they have a whole bunch of employees that they pay in this certain way. So they have to do things their way. I get that. But in any normal situation, if they can't pay you 50% up front, they probably can't pay you. And I know that sounds shitty, mm. but it's true. And a lot of the time I found when people hmm and ha about paying, especially when it's not that much. You know, if you're doing a $500 gig and you can't pay me 50% upfront, I don't think you can afford a $500 gig. Mm -hmm. Or even if you're making yourself able to afford it, like, is that really a wise financial situation for you at that moment? Yeah. And I know like, obviously we want to get the money, you know, we're the, we're the contractors, we want the money from the gig. Mm -hmm. But like a lot of the time you have to be just kind of aware if your client can't afford it, why are you, you know, why are you kicking a dead horse? You know, like, especially if it's somebody you've been talking to for a while, maybe just like say, let me know when you have the budget and then they'll get back to you six months later, but that doesn't waste your time continuing messaging them and asking them like, mm -hmm. when are we doing this? You know, or, or maybe they're already like asking you to do polls or something. You know, I, I think you've been in that situation before mm -hmm. and then you just end up doing all this work and then you still honestly don't know if you're getting paid. Yeah. And that's a terrible place to be in. And yeah. it makes you hate them. It makes them mad at you. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to be in that place at all. I think, it, I think it's a better situation to just not work with them. I think it's very easy to kind of be naive and think totally. that like it won't happen to you. Yeah. And then if you don't take the proper steps necessary to protect yourself, it will probably happen. You know, you. I've worked with a lot of people and I, and I think people are pretty great, but I also think people are the worst. <laughs> and I think that uh, human intuition is a very to each their own kind of thing. Mm -hmm. People will do things you don't expect in situations. And I think you just have to ultimately protect yourself. Mm -hmm. And just, even if you trust this person, even if you like this person, just be there for yourself and just have a contingency plan and have a backup plan. Even if you don't share that with them, but just know like, this is the plan that I have in place. I'm taking a 50% deposit. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a contract. You know, I, I wrote down what I'm gonna be doing in an email, even if you don't have a contract, just make sure it's written somewhere. Just like have all of the all of the terms laid out in advance, even if they're basic. That can be really simple, you know, especially if it's a very simple gig, like, hey, I need an outfit for my concert. Maybe that's just like, you send an email saying, hey, just, just to confirm, here are the terms outlined. I don't think it's necessary for a contract, but here it's just we have it in writing. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, I will meet you on this date and do this. I will style one outfit for you for this show. You know, like specifics like that, like one outfit this date, because, when they message you two days before that day, being like, hey, I thought we were supposed to do today. You can say, no, actually, in the email that I sent you on this date, I mentioned this date. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So I'm not sure why you think that, but I'm available on this date, as I stated. Yes. And that's not rude. That's just professional. Yes. You know, and that's a big distinction to make. That just is. Like being prepared yes. in another way on top of just like being physically prepared, being like almost intellectually prepared. You know, you're ready mm -hmm. for the worst case scenario. You're ready to get paid, you know, like on top of doing the work. And right? it's better safe than sorry. Uh, well. Always, always, you know, and in worst case scenario, you know, if they are going to be your friend and you mention, hey, you know what? I've been burned a lot in the past. I need a 50% deposit. They're going to be like, you know what? Money's a little bit tight right now, but yeah, I'll make that happen. Mm -hmm. Unless they're planning on screwing you over or they're planning on like, yeah. oh, I don't know if I want to pay him. It's based on the project. No, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> you're not a, I mean, I don't know. Maybe you are a high school student. You know what? If you're, if you're 16 years old and you're doing a video as a favor for somebody and they're giving you a hundred bucks, fucking do it. Have fun. Do your gig. Add to your portfolio. Nice. If you're 45, 32, 25, 18, whatever, and you've been doing this for a few years, you know, have some respect for yourself. You know, know what you're worth. Mm -hmm. know, know that in advance. And if somebody's humming and hawing about whether or not to pay you, that's not a good sign. Don't, don't work with them. You know, tell yeah. them I'm available for you once you're sure that you can afford the budget that I presented. Mm -hmm. Or let me know what budget you have. That's why I always start. Like, what's your budget? That's one of the first questions I'll ask when I get approached by a client. Mm -hmm. You honestly, 99% of the time, they won't tell me because that's a pretty personal question. You know, that's like, how much money do you have? <laughs> right? like, yeah. like essentially for an artist, yeah. but like, you know, especially if they are with a label or something, they'll tell you, yes. you know, and when I work with big artists, uh, the, they tell you, that's like one of the first things they tell you. They say it has to be under this map. Mm -hmm. And that's a big number. The one that they give you, you know, it's like under 50 grand or under 20 grand, but like they'll tell you that's in the first meeting when you actually sit down and you hear the content. Like I'm thinking music videos right now specifically, but for anything, you know, they'll tell you Maybe not if you're the stylist, maybe not if you're in the model, but if you're running a creative gig for somebody, which you often do, like when you're doing some styling gigs, you know, or makeup gigs, yeah. you'll be like managing that aspect of the thing for that. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a concert, maybe it's a show, maybe it's a fashion show. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, like outline the parameters, outline the expectations and know what's up. Just bottom line, know what you're doing, know what they expect of you, mm -hmm. get paid. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. Any other, anything else? Or are you are you pretty much more confident now how to get paid? I guess I'm a lot yeah. more confident learning how to ask for what I deserve, I suppose. So there, there you go. go. There you go. It is what you deserve. So yeah, thank you Astrid again for coming back and doing another episode thank you with for me. Having me. Oh, no, my pleasure. Course. And like always, this was Fast Fashion. Uh, you can follow us here on YouTube, on my personal YouTube channel. Uh, make sure to like and comment. And you can follow me on Instagram at Shop by Cash and me on Instagram, which you will. And it's gonna be somewhere. right here because it's it's a little bit hard to spell. But a I mean, little bit of gibberish, but it's a brand. It's a it's a certain <laughs> brand. So, so yeah, thank you so much for watching Fast Fashion, and yeah. we will see you next time. Bye.